Hello and welcome to the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and fearless feminine voices disrupting our society. Today is March 10th, 2022. Here is the Feisty News for Women in World Affairs. On February 24th, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in order to overtake the capital city and claim it as its own territory. Since then, Russia has been punished with 5,356 economic sanctions and accuses the U.S. of economic war while simultaneously continuing to bomb Ukraine, including a maternity and children's hospital. Nearly 1 million Ukraine citizens have managed to escape and others are taking cover in bomb shelters. Throughout all of this madness, we have everyday working women from Ukraine trying to push through after uprooting their lives to escape the war zone. Let's meet one of them. Today we have Lutmila, a Ukraine woman who escaped the war zone and is now volunteering at a blood bank to help vi victims of the Russian invasion. Lutmila, thank you for joining us at the Feisty. I know that this is a tough time for you and I appreciate you taking the time to share your journey. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay, okay. Uh, my name is Ludmila uh, Holovkova. I'm from Kyiv. I've been living in Kyiv since I was 17 years old. Um, I um, I learned in the university there and I just stayed and like continued my life in Kyiv working. I'm 33 years old now, and before the war, uh, I was an uh, environment artist, a 3D artist. I was making game content. So everything you can see uh, when you start any computer game, it's just what environment artists do. So it, well, IT specialist or whatever. Some people, some people call me a programmist, but I'm not. I'm just doing art, artist, CG artist. Right now, I am in Ternopil. Uh, this is a um, Ukrainian city on the west of Ukraine because it's much safer than be in Kyiv. We decided to leave Kyiv um, the same day. It was Thursday when the war started and um, me and my colleagues, we went to the office, like I knew that, like I read the news and um, I was, I mean, I was lost and I decided to go to the office because we have a big office. And before we had this conversation when someone, when, when this is gonna happen, because yeah, like, uh, I can't tell you that we were uh, expecting the Russian invasion, but we knew that they gathered the army and all of that, but nobody actually believed that this stuff gonna happen, that they actually gonna bomb everything. Uh, maybe that was 11 a.m. and I saw, like I was looking through the window and I saw uh, Russian planes like crossing the sky. And I was just, fuck, I have to leave. I have to go. I can't do much. Like I'm, I'm looking at planes that cross in the sky above the Kiev. I have, I have to go. I, I'm not the, I'm civilian. I know nothing about actually war and that's how we decided to go, actually. And uh, me, my colleague, my other colleague, his girlfriend and their dog, um, we just, uh, we sat into my car. I was driving and we began to, um, to leave Kyiv. And it took us 16 hours to go to Chernobyl. And the road was like devastation you know the the worst thing it's 
uh, we were moving like five kilometers per hour to Zhitomir. Uh, it's another big city. And it was, it, it was breaking my heart that there was people who just walking out of Kyiv with um, backpacks, with children. And like, I couldn't help him because my car was very, very like overcrowded. There was like literally no space to breathe. And this is just seeing people. This is heartbreaking. That's, that's how we left Kyiv. I know it must have been tough to want to help, but to know that you could not, Lumila, I understand that. Is there anything else you want the world to know about concerning the invasion? Well, I know that women there uh, are being raped a lot by Russian soldiers, and this is just insane. And I'm sorry, um, I need a minute. Um, oh my God, uh, I can't believe that I'm crying because I didn't cry like, oh, I'm sorry, I just, so um, I just want you not to be silent. And I don't know how you can show it to the Russian people because they just don't believe us. They say that we're attacking ourselves which is completely nuts and just there is so much information on Instagram. There is so much posts. Uh, I can share it with you. I mean, but this is the horrible videos from other regions, from people that are suffering. The, the main problem, the main problem of all of that, that um, Russians, Russian people, they don't have an access to the information and they, uh, they don't speak other language as Russian. They just, they just don't care. They, they don't bother and they support, they support Putin's actions. This is the worst thing. Thank you for sharing, Ludmilla. I'm so glad if you are safe and sound and found a way to help others in the middle, midst of your pain. Keep your head up and know that we are women and we are built for survival. Thank you for surviving and showing us how. In other news, Black women in the United States were nearly three times as likely to die during or shortly after pregnancy over the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic than white women according to a National Center for Health Statistics report that was published last week. With information from over 40 studies across 17 countries, the review found that lockdowns, disruption to maternity service, and fear of attending healthcare facilities all added to pregnancy risks, leading to generally worse results for women and infants. About one third of the pregnant women and new mothers who died in 2020 were Black. Even though Black Americans make up just over 13% of the U.S. population, what is happening? Today, we welcome Dr. Tomi Mitchell to the Feisty. Dr. Tomi is a board-certified family physician with a special concern for Black women, since both of her own pregnancies were problematic due to lack of professional care. Welcome to the Feisty, Dr. Tomi. As a healthcare provider, can you tell us what is going on that allows these statistics to be true? Sure. Thank you, Terika. Thank you for inviting me to the feisty, feisty News today. You know what? This problem has been a problem for decades, like a long time. Okay. Black women, even before COVID, had a two to three times likelihood of dying compared to white women. And COVID really exposed the cracks, which are in the foundation of our healthcare system and society, right? If you look at the social determinants of health and factors that have helped someone have a positive outcome versus a negative, we know that economic status is a factor and race. It is a proven fact studied that black women have worse outlines, sorry, worse outcomes. Reasons, 
there's a history of we're not trusting. And you know, it's for good reason. Like if you go back in history, black people have been experimented for a long time. And there's a history of many black women, regardless of social economic status, not getting their concerns answered in a timely fashion or being like minimized, right? So it's, it's, there's so many issues. And I can say I've seen it professionally and I've also seen this, experienced this personally. So I know it's the truth. You know, in both my pregnancies, I always had hard pregnancies without a doubt. But I mean, either I've been ignored or minimized when I was having complications like postpartum hemorrhage, which is a massive bleed. I've seen it even in my my daughter, who was just a little baby, seeing her ignored when she wasn't breathing and no one believed me. They were like, oh, her lips aren't blue. I'm like, no, she's black. Um, look at the machine. Look at her. Look at the patient. It is. <laughs> now, I'm not going to paint the whole brush like everyone's the same, but some places are worse than others. But it's a fact. It doesn't matter. You could be a physician and I'm a physician who's experienced it. In the news, we see um, Serena Williams. And um, even Beyonce complained on other people who have had adverse outcomes and many of them have died. So we weren't able to actually share their story. So this is a real problem. And, you know, April is Black Maternal um, Week. And, you know, we really need to highlight this because, again, the pandemic really, it just opened what was already there. This is nothing new. It just exposed our vulnerabilities. Dr. Tommy, I understand you. Being proactive, what can we do to help improve the quality of health care we receive? Definitely. I always tell my patients, um, it's so important that you have an advocate. Hopefully there's someone in your family who understands the healthcare system a little bit, who can navigate and who is not afraid to ask questions. And as a patient, you have the right to ask questions. Don't feel, oh, I don't want to bother the doctor. No, that is your, that is their duty to help you. And if they're not doing it in a timely manner, you have the right to complain. So the more we talk about this, the more we bring it to light, they're forced to change. So, and, and also making sure we do our part by going through our regular screenings, preventative um, checkups. And if you feel more comfortable with black providers then seek them out. And for those of you who are young growing up, we do need more black healthcare providers because studies show um, women that and children that have black care providers do better. So we need to look after our own. Yes, everyone else as well, but we are a very vulnerable population, even at this present date and time. Thank you so much, Dr. Tommy. Ladies, she's telling us we have to speak up for ourselves and educate ourselves. If something doesn't feel right, don't blindly accept it. You have to go to war for your well-being. You are worth it. In other news, four men were angry over COVID-19 restrictions, such as the closing of gyms. So they met in Ohio in June 2020 to plot ways to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and take her to Wisconsin for a trial. Authorities learned that they had training exercises and conducted surveillance in Whitmer's home in preparation for a snatch and grab. The four men will face trial in a Michigan courtroom next week. The kidnapping plot is representative of an increasing level of anger and violence towards women in U.S. politics. As more women take political office, they report fervent hostility being aimed at them, from death threats to armed people gathering outside their homes and even vicious attacks on social media that have nothing to do with their positions on government policies and more to do with gender, race, their intelligence, or even their appearances. A state and local government review survey of mayors in communities with over 30,000 residents found that 79% of mayors reported being a victim of harassment, threats, or other psychological abuse. And 13% reported instances of physical violence. Gender was the biggest, biggest predictor of whether mayors would be victims, with female mayors more than twice as likely as male mayors to face psychological abuse, and nearly three times as likely to experience physical violence. The threat of being attacked online or in person may impact a woman's decision to run for office. What woman wants to take a leadership role when they know they will be attacked for doing it? These women. This is why I have such high respect for leadership, period. People who take on the task of leading in a society that punishes them for stepping up deserve support and praise instead of criticism. 
When you encounter a leader of any gender, please do find a way to support them, even if it's a small gesture. It will mean a lot to them in the midst of so many haters trying to drag them back down with them. People attack those who walk a path they are afraid to walk. And even still, these leaders, these ladies, find the heart to continue to stand up for us, for all of us. Thank you, ladies. Oh, it's time for a break. Why is Kelly Clarkson paying child support? Do good men really exist? Answer to these questions and more when we come back. Hi, I am Reverend Dr. Brooke Brim, the Minister of Mind, Body, and Spirit. I'm all about encouraging women to be all that they can be. So that's why I started the brand Vegan Soul Foodie, which encourages us to enjoy traditional American cuisine, but with plants. So traditional soul food is a little bit heavy. I created these cookbooks, vegan soul food salads, smoothies, and juices, vegan soul food for meat lovers, and vegan soul food holiday guide. And I just got out of a class of teaching vegan soul food to Georgia residents, because that's what I do. I teach online how to enjoy soul food made with plants. I write cookbooks, and I support women who want to expand their health. Welcome back. I am T. Erica with the feisty news for women. Girl, guess what? In the news this week, we were all shocked to learn that celebrity singer Kelly Clarkson had reached a settlement in her divorce to her ex-husband, Brandon Blackstock. The two-year divorce proceedings revealed that Kelly will make a one-time payment to Brandon of just over $1.3 million. Additionally, Kelly will pay him $45,601 per month in child support, even though she would have joint custody of their two children. The math didn't add up to me, so I asked our legal expert, Dr. Jean Cirillo, what was going on? Although Dr. Jean was busy, she passed on a note explaining how the financial settlement was reached. Dr. Jean writes, the short answer is that they were awarded or they agreed to joint custody. When there is joint custody, the couple split the expenses for child support according to the percentage of each parent's gross income. That's gross income, not net. Usually at 17% or 8.5% of each if it's for one child and 23% and then 29% for two or three children. Therefore, whether the child actually lives on the premises of one versus the other isn't as important as paying for expenses such as the private school where Kelly has to pay 70% of the tuition along with clothing and travel and possible food expenses. He also is awarded spousal support, which usually goes on for at least a few years, and he decided to give up his career as an agent to be a full-time rancher, meaning he can stay at home with the children. Okay, I get it now. Thank you, Dr. Jean, for explaining what happened. Now we understand why this successful woman has since declared that she will never get married again. Maybe it's the pain of divorce, or maybe it's just sage wisdom. We'll support your decision either way, Kelly. Just be happy. Moving right along. You know what? I am a strong woman. I am a smart woman. In addition to being a feisty woman, I am also a wounded woman. After decades of trauma brought on by men passing through my life, I am so weighed down by emotional pain that I find it nearly impossible to relieve it. I know there are other women who once felt like I do and then went on to experience the difference a good experience with a good man can make in a woman's life. I know, here at the Feisty, I consistently point out the disdainful behaviors of men, but even I know all men are not predators. There are men who stand with women, supporting them willingly with love. I went in search of women who could say that they had good men in their lives to offer you, me, and other wounded women visual proof that there is hope for love and our futures as we continue to strive to create a feminist society. Good men do exist. Just ask Caitlin. Hey, Caitlin. 
Do you know a good man? I absolutely know a good man. His name is Ash and I met him shortly after going through a couple of different abusive relationships and after going through a double mastectomy. I am the author and director of a project called Beauty After Breast Cancer and Ash, who is now my husband, was integral in making that project happen because 29 and single with a double mastectomy makes for about the world's most awkward dating conversation. It's kind of like, hi, I'm Caitlin. So nice to meet you. Hope you're not a boob guy. When I met Ash and had this really challenging discussion of, oh, by the way, just went through this surgery, he instantly figured out how insecure I was about this. And the very first time that we were together in any kind of intimate way, the first thing he did was show attention to my scars in a very gentle and a very loving way with no judgment whatsoever. And the no judgment piece, that was a really big difference for me from anything that I had experienced in relationships prior to that. My time with Ash has been absolutely colored by his respect, his humor, and his total willingness to let me heal, not by telling me what he thinks I need, but by giving me what I need and checking in on a really regular basis to make sure that that has been happening. When I first set off to really get back in touch with myself after my breast cancer journey, he sent me up to my closet and said, all right, no, no, no. I'm gonna pick out clothes for you. You're gonna put these on. I'm gonna take your picture. And I came back and he had all the wardrobe figured out. And he would take these pictures with the, the shirt kind of sexy unbuttoned over my reconstructed boobs. And he would show me these amazing pictures he had taken of me. And he let me see myself through his eyes. And every single time, I look at myself through his eyes. I see someone beautiful. I see someone who deserves the kind of love that I have found from this man. And in 13 years now of marriage, I can't think of a single instance in which I have ever been treated with anything but respect. Even if my request is something silly, like the coffee tastes better when you make it or this strange little thing here is what makes me feel loved today. There is no judgment. There is only love, respect, solid communication, and the amazing humor and passion from someone that for many years, I guess I had only hoped that I could deserve. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you so much, Ash, for being an example that good men do exist. Ash, we love you here at The Feisty. May blessings rain down on you in everything you do. Thank you for watching The Feisty News for Women. Remember, be feisty. Women must be seen and heard. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty. News for women.